Now, before I take this message, I just want to say that uh, I might not come every single week as I used to, since I have something some afternoon to deal with personally, but I enjoy preaching uh, the word to you, and I'll come whenever, as, as often as I can, you know, to minister to you, to, uh, to be a friend. And I think the teens will start coming next month, you know, next month, the first Sunday of every single month, starting next month, so it should be great. Now, the title of the sermon this afternoon is called John 3.16. John 3.16, because it's the most famous verse in the Bible. You know, even the atheists have John 3.16 memorized, most of them. You know? So most of the Bible verse, look like Psalm 23, 1 Corinthians 13, even the unbelievers know these verses, because our rock is greater than any other rock. Even the unbelievers, even the heathen themselves, know the word of God. You know, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, and He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I'm going to talk about six doctrines you can draw from this verse. Six major doctrines from John 3.16. Now, the Bible says that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So the first doctrine you can get is the doctrine of Trinity. Because we know that for there are three that we have recorded in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. We know that there's one God, one essence, but there are three persons. You have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible says God sent forth His only begotten Son, which is Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. Talking about Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is God. Some people believe He is just a good teacher, but He's not just a good teacher. He is the Son of God. But he's not only the Son of God, He's God in the flesh. He's God Himself, because Jesus Christ is with God from the beginning. The Bible says Christ died for us from the foundation of the world. He took on a human form 2,000 years ago, right? Born in the Virgin Mary. But Jesus Christ has always existed because He is God. He's in the beginning with God. In Genesis, the Bible says, let us create man in our image. So right in the very first book of Genesis, the doctrine of Trinity has been revealed. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 18, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He had declared Him. The only explanation for that verse to make sense is the doctrine of Trinity. The Bible says no man has seen God at any time. Talking about God the Father. But the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He had declared Him. So we know the doctrine of Trinity, right in the, uh, the, the, the book of John. Now, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So the great verse to prove the deity of Christ. The Bible says in Hebrew chapter 1, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Talking about, is addressing to Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is not only the Son of God, He is God in the flesh. He is God, right? Now, one of the um, controversial verse the people always bring is Mark chapter 10, verse 18, and Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now, people, people may tell you, you know, you are telling me Jesus is telling you he is not God, but because Jesus Christ said, Why call me good? There is only one good, that is God. But here's the problem. He is Jesus good. <laughs> and he is God, right? Otherwise, you are claiming that Jesus Christ is not good. So this verse is not a proof against the deity of Christ. It's actually a proof for the deity of Christ, because Jesus Christ is good. And the only good being is God. If Jesus Christ is not good, if He is not perfect, then He cannot pay for our sin. Only a perfect being can pay for our sin. If Jesus Christ is not good, if He is not perfect, then He has to pay for His own sin, right? He, he died for the sin of the whole world. Now, the doctrine of Trinity is so important because it's the gospel. You know, God the Father sent His Son to die for us. We have to trust in Him. We have to trust in Jesus. It is closely related to the doctrine of salvation, this doctrine of Trinity. Now, when we're talking about love, loving other people, it is loving to sacrifice yourself, right? But the love of Christ is greater than that. You know, sacrificing yourself is not the greatest love. The greatest love is you're sacrificing your only begotten Son. That's about it in Romans chapter 8, that... He that spareth not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Sometimes we, we talk about God died for us, right? We're talking about God sacrificing himself. 
but but we we forget the picture. God sent forth His Son to die for us. See, it's one way to sacrifice yourself. It's another kind of love to sacrifice your loved one, to sacrifice your only begotten Son. That's that can show you a greater picture of the love of Christ, the love of God. He 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 sacrificed His only begotten Son to save the whole world, so that the whole world might be saved by believing on His name. Bible says in First John chapter four verse eight, "He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love." In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Hearing His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So when we know the doctrine of Trinity, we have a greater picture of the love of Christ. You know, because it's one thing to sacrifice yourself, and it's a greater love to sacrifice your only begotten Son. So the first doctrine we can learn we can learn is the doctrine of Trinity. You know, Jesus Christ is God, is the deity of Christ. Now the second doctrine we can we can learn is the Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now the second doctrine we can debunk is the doctrine of Calvinism. The Bible says, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now the doctrine of Calvinism believes Jesus Christ only died for a certain amount of people. Jesus Christ only died for the elect. The Bible is clear, He died for the whole world. The Bible says, For whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish. If you believe, you are saved. Whosoever. If you, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ can be saved. It's not that you have to be the elect. You have to be joined by God. The Bible says He will join all men unto you. you know, these covenants try to twist that verse. The Bible says, uh, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. But they forget to read the couple of ch chapters after. The Bible says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. See, it is the will of God that all men should be saved. See, these Calvinists, they are, they are teaching that, you know, all men can be saved. Jesus only died for the elect, only the elect can be saved. But that's contradictory to the Bible. The Bible says, His will is for all men to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. Now, these people are trying to twist that verse. They are, they are claiming we have been predestined by God. You know, God has predestined everything. But the, the doctrine of predestination is taught in the Bible, but it's not what they say. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, we are being elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So we, we are being predestined according to the foreknowledge. See, God knows who is, who is going to get saved, but that, but that does not mean God control, God, God for someone to be saved. See, when we are going back home, when we are uh, watching the football game play, played yesterday, right? We know the outcome, but, but the player on the field are still have the freedom to play. See, God is living outside of time. He knows the outcome. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows who is going to go to hell, who is going to go to heaven, but people still have the freedom of the choice because we are being elect, we are being predestined according to foreknowledge because He is omniscient. You know, he is all-knowing. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine it to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the first, firstborn among many brethren. So we are being predestined according to the foreknowledge of God. Now the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So, Calvinism believes Jesus Christ is the Savior of the elect, right? But the Bible says He is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe, which means He is also the Savior of those that do not believe. The difference is, the difference is they have to believe in Him to go to heaven. But Jesus Christ died for everyone. He died for especially He died for all men, especially for those that believe. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter two verse nine, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That's right. It's not the elect. You know, the communism will, will, will teach you, oh, it doesn't really mean all. Does every means every? <laughs> like he said, he tastes death for every man. You can't be that. You know, these people are twisting the Bible. You know, Jesus Christ died for the whole world. He died for all Sinners. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
the covenant teaches everything happens based on the will of God. It's all the will of God. Not that the Calvinism yet try to teach you that. But the will of God is all men should be saved. So they can't really pull this verse out of context. So first, we know the doctrine of the Trinity. God sent forth His Son. Second, we know Calvinism is false. Jesus Christ died for everyone. If you believe in Him, whosoever believes in Him should not perish. He will never go to hell but have everlasting life. And the third doctrine we can learn is salvation only in Christ. Salvation only through Jesus. The Bible says that, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. See, your dad has not died for you. Your mom didn't die for you. Your pastor did not die for you. But Jesus Christ died for you. Amen. That's what the Bible says, whosoever believeth in Him. In whom? In Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. See, it's only by the name of Christ we can be saved. It's not by trusting in anything else, like baptism or church attendance. Baptism does not take you to heaven. The blood of Christ does. See, we are being washed away. Our sins are being washed away by the blood of Christ. Some people... Some people, because of health reason, can never be baptized. So how can they go to heaven? The Bible is clear for whosoever believeth in Him, in Christ, and in Christ alone. The Bible is in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, it's Jesus Christ that died, that died for you, not, not everyone else. Not any pastors, teachers, prophets, but Jesus Christ died for you. The Bible says, but God commended. Now the word command sometimes can mean present, sometimes can mean show, but command can also mean elevates. He praises his love toward us. See, his love is greater than, greater than our love. See, we can spare, we can spare our possession, we sometimes can spare our uh, leisures, our money, but Jesus Christ, God spared his son. He praises his love. He's, he's elevating his love beyond our personal love, our human love, because, you know, he sacrificed his only begotten son. We have a famous verse, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we see the salvation is only in Jesus Christ, it's not in anyone else, because the Bible says, For whosoever believeth in Him, very important, it's the blood, it's the blood of Christ that have the atonement on our sin. So we talk about the doctrine of Trinity. We talk about why Calvinism is false. We talk about salvation only in Christ. Now, the fourth doctrine we can draw is the eternal security of the believers. The Bible says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Which means, once you are saved, you are always saved. You are sealed with, unto, the Spirit, unto the day of redemption by the Spirit. Some people may say, what about you commit suicide? What about murder? What about adultery? That, that, that's not relevant. Because if going to heaven is a gift of God, it, it doesn't matter how good you are. See, David, King David, a man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, David committed murder and adultery, but he's in heaven because he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. If you perish because of anything you've done, then that life is not everlasting. See that? Some people may say, well, what if you stop believing? I mean, I mean, I've talked about this before, but the Bible says, you know, and if we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. But I don't believe we can stop believing because in the Bible there are only two groups of people. Those who believe and those who have not believed in the first place. If someone claimed to be saved and five years from now they became an atheist, they don't believe in the same place. They don't believe in the first place. Because once we believe in Christ, you know, the Spirit of God grows in us. Jesus Christ said, my sheep hears my voice. So if, if someone becomes a Christian, and then he became a Mormon, and then he did not give Christ, then I, I don't think he's saved in the first place. Because if he had the Spirit of God, you know, he shall, he shall follow God's Word, shall follow the, the guidance of God. So suicide, murder, stealing, adultery does not take away your salvation. God will punish you on this earth for something you've done, but God will never send you to hell. Because the Bible is giving us a promise, if you believe in Him, you shall never perish but have everlasting life. 
the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse, tw- verse, verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck, me, pluck, pluck them out of my Father's hand. Some people may say, what if you... Um, God is holding your hand, right? What if you let it go? What if you just walk away? But the problem is, God is holding your hand. He says, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. No man, including yourself. See that? See, even if you walk away, even if that's possible, the thing is, it's not possible. But even if you walk away, that's still everlasting. It's still eternal. See, what you do after you are saved gives you rewards in heaven. It's a separate transaction. Believing Jesus Christ, you are saved. Anything you've done, any good works you've done after you are saved earns your rewards in heaven. If you, do, if you do something really bad, God might punish you hard on this earth. God might take away your life because you have, you have no, no use of Him. God might, God might take you to heaven as, as early as possible because you, 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 are, you have no use. You are wicked and slothful. You are not producing fruit. That's why the Bible commands us to bear fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 folks. We are, we, are being, we are being commanded to do great works unto God, unto Him. So we see the doctrine of Trinity. We see the, 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 the falsehood of Calvinism. And we also see that salvation is only in Jesus. We also saw the doctrine of the eternal security. Now the fifth doctrine I, I, I want to talk about is, we have heard the phrase, everyone has a chance to be saved. Everyone has a chance to be saved. I, I agree with that partially, because everyone does have a chance to be saved. But the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world. Now, in the Bible, there's a doctrine called a doctrine of uh, a reprobate. Like, I believe 99% of the people have the chance to be saved, but the unsaved might reach to a point when God will, when they will lose the opportunity to get saved. Because, because the Bible says in Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. The Bible says, seek him while he may be found. So it, it, it might imply there might be a time he may not be found. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 28, they, they shall, um, then, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. See, the unsaved, eventually, the Bible describing will reach to a point they will lose the chance to be saved. The Bible says in, in Revelation 22, verse, verse 19, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of his prophecy, talking about changing the Bible, taking away the verse and words from the Bible, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The Bible says if anyone uh, deliberately change the word of, of the Bible, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Now, this is not talking about the, the saved Christian, because once we are saved, we are always saved. But I was talking about the unsaved will lose the chance to be saved if they are taking God's word, you know, changing the word of God, taking away the word of God. And the other place, the Bible says in Matthew 12, verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blas- blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men, and whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. The Bible says if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, there is no forgiveness, both in this world and in the world to come. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know what, this, what it means to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. But it must be a very serious iniquity, a serious Transgression. Now, I don't believe the saved Christian will blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. Because once we are saved, we are always saved. What that means is the unsaved people, if they blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, will not have the opportunity to get saved. God shall take away his part from the book of life. Now, I don't know what that means about the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. I, I don't think it's saying a cause word against the Holy Ghost. I don't think, I don't think that's the case. But it, but, it, but it must be a very serious offense. Now, the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, right? We know that God loved 
everyone concerning salvation. Everyone who believes in Christ can be saved. But there are also verses in the Bible telling you, for example, Psalm chapter 5, verse 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, thou hatest all workers of iniquity. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 9, verse 15, And their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. So we have a, a, we have God saying, I will love them no more. And we have in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. There's no contradiction because God says, I will love you no more. Which means God loves you at some point in your life. It will reach to a point after you have been rejecting God over and over again. And God will tell you, I will love you no more. Now, I don't believe I don't believe a lot of people are in this situation. I only believe like a very tiny person, like one percent of people God has given over. You know, God has given over to our good mind. Because this is in the Bible. We cannot shy away from, from not preaching that. Because the Bible is clear that God says, I hated them. I will love I will love them no more, which means God has loved you at some point, like Pharaoh. You know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Because he hardened his own heart. Eventually, you know, God used Pharaoh to declare his name. But Pharaoh, I believe he's a reprobate. You know, God hardened his heart uh, to, to actually show forth his miracles towards the Israelites. That's how the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he said, I have heard thee in a time of accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So we should get saved now. If you are not saved, we should get saved right now because you don't know when, uh, when some tragedy, when some accident will, 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 will take place tomorrow. Maybe when I drive back home tonight, I'll slip into the cliff and die. I don't know. Because when, after, you, you, after you are dead, you have lost the chance. See, after you are dead, you, you have lost the chance to be saved. That's what the Bible commands us. Get saved right now. Don't wait because now is the day of salvation. So we've talked about the doctrine of Trinity, we talk about uh, the, 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 fa- the falsehood of Calvinism, we talk about salvation only in Christ, we talk about the eternal secret of the believers, we talk about how God can both love and to end his judicial hatred at the same time. And the last doctrine from John 3.16 is the doctrine against dispensational salvation. The Bible says in John 3.16 that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It indicates whoever believes in him, right? And that was for God so loved the world. Notice the love is past tense. For God so loved the world. That he gave us the God and the Son. Because when was Jesus Christ crucified? Most everyone say it's 2,000 years ago. But the Bible says Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, it's not because the Old Testament, they have to do good or sacrifice animals to do all the blood atonement, the wave offering, heave offering, all these sacrifices, all these atonements to go to heaven. It's a picture of the sacrifice of Christ. We talk about, you know, in the Old Testament, we are looking forward to the cross, and we are looking back to the cross. It's all about the cross. That's what the Bible says, for God so loved the world, past tense. Jesus Christ died for us once. He sacrificed for us from the foundation of the world. Now the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, and not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the word began. Now, this dispensational salvation teaches that in the Old Testament people are saved by works, and in the New Testament we're being saved by faith. But that's not what the Bible says. In Romans chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, What shall we say then, that, our, that, our, that, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, had said, For if Abraham were justified by works, he had wealth to glory, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is not the reward, uh, now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckon of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So the Bible says in the book of Romans, Abraham was not justified by works. Now Abraham is in the Old Testament, right? 
So if Abraham was being justified by works, then why did the Bible use Abraham as an example of salvation by grace through faith? It doesn't make any sense. Now those people will tell you Abraham is pre-law. <laughs> you know, it's pre-law. That, that, that doesn't count. Okay, let's keep reading. What about David? <clears throat> Even as David also described the, the blessings of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. See, Abraham knows. So David is right in the middle of the pre-law and the age of grace. But David also being used as an example of salvation by grace through faith. So there's no way to twist that scripture. There's no way to claim it in the Old Testament that are being saved you know, by, by works. It's always by the blood of Christ. It's always by faith. Now, if in the Old Testament they can say by works, why can't we do that now? Because our works have always been the filthy rags. It's always the blood of Christ. Our works will never save us. It wouldn't. You know, it, it, our, our works have not saved us in the past. It will not save us in the future because no man can be perfect. There's only one good being, which is God himself. There's one verse that can debunk this message of salvation. Acts 10, verse 43. To him, to him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. The Bible says, to him give all the prophets witness, including the prophet in the Old Testament. You know, from Adam to Zechariah. From every single prophet, from the Old Testament to, new, to, to the New Testament, is preaching the message that whosoever believeth in Christ shall receive remission of sins. So we, so we talk about the doctrine of Trinity. How God sent forth His Son to die for us. We must believe that Jesus Christ died for us and He rose again to go to heaven to receive salvation. Number two, I talk about well, why Calvinism is false. You know, the Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, especially for those that believe. The will of God is for everyone to be saved. If you believe in Christ, you are saved. Number three, I talk about salvation only in Christ. You can't trust in anything else. You can't trust in your works. You can't trust in baptism. You can't trust in your mom, your dad, your pastor, your friends. It's only believeth in Him. And number four, I talk about once you are saved, you are always saved. You have you receive eternal life the moment you believe on Him. And nothing can nothing you can ever do to lose that because the Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Number five, I talk about how to reconcile the love of God and the hatred of God together. You know, God loved everyone concerning salvation unconditionally. If you believe on Him, God loves you. You can be saved. But don't wait when it's too late. You know, because we don't know when, when some tragic will happen, when we go out and hit by a car, when there's an earthquake, tornado. I don't know. So we should get saved right now. Don't wait when, that's when it's too late. Number six, I talk about the, the folly of the, of the dispensation of salvation. You no, know, we are always by we are we are always saved. We have always been saved by grace through faith. In the Old Testament, New Testament, you no, know, from Adam to me, you know, from from the first person to the last person living on this earth, you know, from from the pre-law period even to the millennium is salvation by grace through faith. Now let, let me just close the sermon with one more verse. I was in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scriptures is given by the is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You see, in this one verse, John 3, 16, we can draw at least six doctrines from the Bible. See, the Bible is a is a is a magical book. It's, it's a spiritual book. If you study that, you can draw a nice application of doctrine. You see, John 3, 16 is the one of the most important verses in the Bible. But you can have so many wonderful truths in that verse. That's what the Bible commands us to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rather dividing the word of truth. You should compare in scripture with the scripture to learn the word of God. Learn what the spirit learn what the spirit has to say to us believers so we can magnify his name, we can glorify his name, so we can lift up the rock of our salvation because their rock is not as our rock. Even even our enemy ourselves will testify against will, will, will testify for that. 
So we should elevate his name, let, let not his name be lightly esteemed, but lift him up, because he is the Savior of all men, especially for those that believe. Amen? Let's pray.